All right, I have six o'clock, so I think we're going to get started here. Um, we do have a quorum. We'll just wait for Humera. Uh, we'll have Humera join us. Great. So welcome, everyone, to the August 24th Hadley Public School School Committee meeting. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We do have uh, two adjustments to the agenda and one reminder. So um, the two adjustments to the agenda is um, it appears that the public comment was left off of the agenda that was posted, but um, we do intend to have public comment tonight and we are happy to see public uh, attendees tonight. Hey, Humera. Hey, how are you? Good, we just got started. Terrific. So uh, we, we will need to add uh, before the presentations and discussion items. So we'll, we'll add that to the agenda. Um, the second adjustment that we have is that as we are discussing um, the, the metrics and progress and progressing through reopening phases, we also need to incorporate a discussion regarding reopening and new guidance on special populations from DESE uh, regarding um, Hadley Public School children who are children of teachers. So we need to incorporate that in as an adjustment to the agenda as well. Um, and a reminder, I wanted to give uh, Ms. Camuso and um, Ms. Dowd a chance to remind folks about the upcoming Q&A session. Um, if you'd like to start with that, I just want to make sure folks are aware of the Q&A, your expectations of that, the format of that, and um, the date and time, all that good stuff. So I'll ask uh, either Jen or April if you'd like to speak to that just to start. Sure, I can do that. So we're going to have a Zoom session on Wednesday, the 26th at 5 p.m. Um, so that link was sent out in an email by uh, Annie, and I also sent one out. I don't remember. Um, I don't get all your parent emails, Jen, if you sent one too. And there's one on the Facebook page as well. So we will start by the both of us sort of talking briefly together, but we're, we're mostly looking for questions that parents might have. Uh, families might have. And so we're going to leave most of that time simply to a basic question and answer, whatever it may be. So we will both be there together so that anyone who assumes in multiple areas, or if there's any questions that might cover both schools, we can answer those together. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Jen? No, you covered it. Um, I think it's going to be a great opportunity just to be on the same page and answer as many questions. I know everybody has a lot mm -hmm. um, before the start of school. And um, so I'm um, I'm glad that we're doing that for families. And there will be a separate one for staff. We're doing staff meetings on Thursday. So um, I'll be able to answer questions for staff and, and families will be Wednesday evening. And the Director of Student Services, Pam Haywood, will also be there as well. Um, that's good for the families to know that also. So some questions for you. If students have questions, are they welcome to attend your Q&A? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'd love to get one five-year-old to ask me a question. That would, that would make my day. Excellent. And if, um, do you anticipate possibly having another Q&A scheduled before September 14th? Well, I would see um, how many questions we can get answered in the first one. We still have lots of planning that needs to happen um, with staff. But um, I wouldn't see that that would be an issue. And um, Principal Camuso and I have, have done a nice job of kind of putting ourselves out there on social media as well. Um, so maybe we can um, do another face, uh, Facebook live stream. Um, yeah, I have one of those set up for September 1st right now at 11. Um, so depending uh, what your schedule is like, then you're more than welcome to come to that. And then at Hopkins, we do have orientation set up on the 9th and the 10th. So some of that information that is for students, not that parents can't lurk in the background and participate in that. But I, I really want the students to be a main part of that. Um, so that will be uh, another place. Um, but then, yeah, I guess another formal Q&A will kind of depend on how Wednesday goes and those things go. If we, if we need to hold another one, we definitely will. Yeah. 
During the professional development days, we are planning some time for teachers to be working out what their communication to their families is going to look like. So I'm sure a lot of that will be um, answering some specific questions per grade level and having the classroom teachers reach out uh, to their families. So that will be an important piece. Um, but of course, we're always available by email and phone um, in the middle if, if things pop up. Um, I always encourage my families to reach out. And I just sent out a, a correspondence today with class lists and some other important information. So um, even if you have a question, you don't have to wait for one of the dates. You can always just reach us by email. That's great. Mm -hmm. Great. And just a reminder for folks that um, this, this Q&A session is not a, a school committee meeting. Uh, of course, school committee members may be present as parents. Um, we will, I'm sure, be present as parents, but um, it is not something that is held to the same kind of um, uh, protocol that we have around what we will have with the upcoming uh, public comment that we're, we'll have in this meeting. So it does really give folks a chance to dialogue um, in a Q&A format. And as you both said, uh, should families or parents wish to send questions in advance, you are welcome to do so. Um, and they can be addressed as part of the Q&A as well. Great. Okay. Um, thanks, guys, for that reminder. I think that helps frame uh, the Q&A, and I know that's coming up um, this Wednesday. That's great. We're excited for that. So with now uh, the new adjustment, we're going to add uh, public comment to the agenda. Apologies that that was not on there originally, but yes, we do have public comment. So um, given we do have a number of public in attendance, if you would like to um, make public comment, please raise your digital hand and I will call on you. The protocol around public comment is um, we limit three minutes uh, for speakers in the interest of um, having everyone get an opportunity uh, to comment as well as moving through. And it really has to do with every room at Hadley Elementary School fits a different amount of children. So we had to, and first grade is one of our largest grades. And so we had to put them on end classrooms so that we could fit more children. But it's all laid out in there um, for you to read. Okay. Heather, uh, it's Annie, and I just need you, want you to know that Missy Aloisi has her hand up. She's on she's on the phone, but so her hands on. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Lindsay. And I, I, I would encourage you to follow up if there's, um, and we'll follow up regarding the specific question that you had. Um, all right. Ms. Missy Aloisi. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, in this meeting, are you going to be covering the criteria? Um, on how um, specifically what you're going to be relying upon as credible information, or is that future? Yes, that is a discussion topic tonight, um, looking at the metrics that will be utilized for um, progressing through reopening phases. Okay. Um, my comment is, um, and forgive me if this is duplicate of your work, is that I, I spoke directly with the Town of Hadley Board of Health by email. Um, because I wanted to be prepared for this meeting and, and clarify some facts that I think have been um, out there about how the town is reporting. And I clarified that if school choice children, as well as college kids, um, if they are requested to be tested, it will go to their home. The results will get counted in that home residential address. And so um, I don't know what population of our school choice kids are not in Hampshire County, because if we're going to be relying upon Hampshire County data, then we want to make sure, you know, we're including the school choice children that are not in Hampshire County, because that would be a skewed information. Um, as well as my biggest concern was the college kids um, who have come back. And uh, my example, I wrote to them in an email, and I can gladly forward it to you all, is, you know, if a student comes from Iowa and moves in off campus or on campus at UMass, for, for an example, um, 
they get tested at the Mullen Center, their results get counted back in Iowa because that's the, ch the student's permanent address. So I just wanted us to be aware of that. I wanted to, you know, get a factual information. Um, and that's all I have for a comment right now. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks. And I don't see any, is our um, Board of Health representative on the phone tonight? I know she's been uh, here previously. I do see our select board representative, yeah. Jane. Yeah, that would be Dr. Mosler. I do not see her. Okay. Okay. But I can forward that email to you guys if you would like it, um, just to have those exact examples. Um, that would be desire. very helpful. We um, because I do I do anticipate that may be part of our discussion tonight. Um, right. And I also would have thought that it would be whatever their mailing address was, even if it was off campus. Um, yeah, I wanted to confirm that because I've heard both ways. And you know, my sister works for the NIH in New in uh, DC, and she had even believed that it would go, um, you know, to the residential mailing address, and so that would we would need to know that the address that the student is registered as is in Hampshire County for you to no, rely on those numbers. Okay, thank you very much for that sure. information. Okay. I will mute. Is there any more public comment for tonight? I'm looking for digital hands if you would like to speak. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will then move out of public comment and into our presentation and discussion items. So our first one is review of the metrics and progressing through reopening phases. Annie, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and I in turn will invite the school committee to uh, talk publicly about their thoughts on this. So we had talked about the two major categories, the two broad categories that we're looking at when we are determining whether or not to maintain a current phase, regress or progress forward, would be analyzing uh, community transmission and school transmission rates. So community transmission rate, um, recently DPH has increased uh, some of the data that's available to people. So on their weekly report, which you can find on their website, they now shade individual towns. So they have a shading system. This was brought, I think, to the attention of the school committee last week. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Department of Public Health started shading communities. And the shading corresponds with case count or recent increases in cases. So that doesn't correspond exactly with testing positivity rate. And then in areas of um, that are greater than 100,000, they have a shading system of red yellow and green. Um, and so red is to indicate that perhaps the town or the district in that town should consider whether or not to continue into another phase or whether or not we should be looking at um, remote learning at that point. Green would indicate that the town that the risk is reduced sufficiently or it is safe enough to return to in-person learning or be in in-person learning. Um, if a town has less than 100,000 people, you see it's essentially unshaded like Hadley. Um, so they have, they've added county data. They've, we have town data. When we're looking at things like community transmission, one way to analyze that is by testing positivity rates. Those are the most common. That was the first metric that we included in our district reopening plan. We said that at a minimum, we should be looking at a testing positivity rate that is less than 5% in Hampshire County. We initially started with that metric. This was before DPH started publishing these county data or had their shading system. Uh, this came from a conversation I had with Dr. Allen. He recommended that we utilize an area that had, had at least 100,000. So immediately Hadley would be too small. Hampshire County, I believe has about 160,000 people. So he recommended using Hampshire County. It also makes sense for us. I know people are concerned about school choice, but in our most recent school choice data that um, we have from the state, so last spring, um, while we do have many school choice students, only nine of them come from outside of Hampshire County. 
So in all, uh, as of the spring, five were from Hamden County, four from Franklin County, and one from Berkshire County. Um, so you're talking uh, a very, in, very, very small percentage of our population in Hadley Public Schools. The majority of our school choice children come from Hampshire County, from neighboring districts in Hampshire County. So if you look at testing positivity rate, which they now have minimally, that should be under 5%. And again, uh, in the reopening plan, as of July 9th, we'd included data from John Hopkins that provided state data. Um, and now we have the data from the county that will give us, from DPH that will give us county data. Uh, in addition to that, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education does want us to look at data in Hadley. This is why they've added shading even for towns that are under 100,000. When it comes to school transmission, I've said before, that is not something that uh, is synonymous with absolute case count. It's connected to case count, but you can have positive cases and that does not necessarily mean that those cases are a result of a problem with school transmission. It could be that students all attended the same party. So if there was a party, a bunch of children went there, that that's kind of a hot spot. But then those students immediately are quarantined or um, they aren't immediately back in school or they aren't in school for, for a, their, their presence in school does not translate into transmission because no children outside of that event who attend school become positive. That's the distinction. Case count does not necessarily mean that there's an issue with school transmission, but the two big topics, the two big things that the school committee should be looking at are community transmission rates and school transmission rates. You can analyze community transmission by looking at testing positivity rates. You can look at increases in case count over the last two weeks. You can look at absolute case count. Usually you want to look at obviously increases and changes. Um, and uh, regarding school transmission, that requires a lot more clinical judgment. And that's where I'd explain that our nurses working with Board of Health and working with DPH um, and our consulting physician, they would contact trace, they would analyze what happens in the wake of determining there's a positive case. If we thought we had school transmission, the governor has made available now mobile units that will be available to go out to schools to do widespread testing in schools and to try to determine the extent to which school transmission exists. So that resource just came up last week. We were informed about it last week. I know the school committee has been thinking about in looking at community transmission questions such as, uh, that 5% is, um, is that where they're most comfortable? I know that some of you have considered weighted averages. Again, I've given you the numbers of school choice children that attend from other counties. Um, and now I really invite the school committee to have a discussion about what they think in terms of what we should be looking at, how we should measure those two um, things. Tara, you had provided um, some interesting information around uh, like a matrix. Do you want to speak to that? You had mentioned this at our last meeting when we were discussing bringing in that view. Yeah, so I had a couple different things. I started kind of just looking at um, what other districts are doing while I was kind of looking at recommendations. And it's, it's hard because there, there's a lot kind of all over the place. And in order to look at what is most relevant to us in Western Massachusetts, rather than looking at the Eastern part of the state, it makes it that much, it makes it that much harder to figure out what the right way to go is. So um, I did find information and I did um, share it with you guys. And the, the one that I liked the most to be honest is um, um, Amherst Regional. They did a really good job. Um, actually, I should clarify, Amherst Regional actually took a lot of their data um, and their basic for metrics from the Cambridge Public Schools. And both of those, uh, both of those schools referenced um, the Harvard um, Global Health Institute. So then I then um, looked that up and they've got, um, they've got a neat graph on there um, that allows you to look at, let me pull it up so I don't misspeak. It allows you to look at um, transmission rates. Um, it narrows it down by your state, and then it looks at um, 
it looks at um, daily cases per 100,000 people and it uses a seven day moving average on it. Um, and so it's interesting to look at. And I did realize today I was looking at it right before, um, right before we um, signed on that, you know, I think we'd have to take um, their actual data when you look at the graph with a, with a grain of salt, because they're not going to update it the same way that mass DPH is going to update that. Um, but we can look at kind of their principles um, behind it. So they, they use as well a color coded system. Um, and they also use green, yellow, um, orange, and red. And what they do is they look at cases um, per 100,000 people per day. And so for instance, less than one case per 100,000 people, again, it's per day, you're on track for containment. They give very, they're, they're general guidelines. They're not like exact guidelines, they're general. So you monitor with viral testing and contact tracing program. Then you move into the yellow, which is the one to nine cases per 100,000. Um, you make sure that rigorous testing and tracing programs are in place. You look at orange and that's anywhere from 10 to 24 cases per 100,000 people, that's accelerated. That's when stay at home orders are starting to be put in place and rigorous testing and tracing programs are advised. And then you look at the red level, which is more than 25 cases. And that's where stay at home orders are necessary. And this, you know, a lot of this is out of our control um, when it comes to um, real um, rigorous contact tracing, we kind of have to defer to what the state and the county are doing, but just kind of extrapolating based on where they consider risky. Um, I What I looked at was said, okay, if we look at the orange level, which is 10 to 24 cases per 100,000 people, and we look at that over the seven days, you get 70 new cases per 100,000 people if you look at Hampshire County altogether. So when you look at the Hampshire County data for um, the DPH, we're at that right now, right? So that's good. You know, at your starting point that you've met that baseline. So then you monitor cases as you go to make sure that you don't get past that tipping point. But I don't think it should be just one thing. Like I think I had mentioned before too, and Annie had mentioned before, I just, I think it really needs to be multifactorial when we look at this. I don't think we can use one point. So when we look at school transmission data, um, I kind of looked at it as school transmission data absolutely needs to be a part of it. And that is, as Annie said, more clinical judgment where the nurses are involved and the board of health is involved. And you really look at there's an actual problem within the school when it comes to extensive transmission of the virus. Um, I think we need to look at a case count. And I also think we need to look at percent positivity and cut a better well-rounded picture. So percent positivity and case count, we can kind of look at, those are like very, very point blank, black and white measures that we can look at um, without there being any gray area. So you have those two points. Then you look at school transmission data to determine if there's really a problem. Um, and, then, and then looking at the Hadley case count. So, I don't like the map that is put out um, for Massachusetts. And, and the reason I don't like it is because of what Annie said, we've got around 5,000 people in the town of Hadley. And I think I've heard um, a little bit of um, discussion outside of meetings, how Hadley will be in the red zone with one case. It takes one case to be in that red zone, right? And that's not, that's not really realistic to close down a school. Right. So then I started looking at, um, honestly, full disclosure, with the help of my husband, um, looking at what what is that threshold. Right. So when you look at it and if Hadley exceeds five case counts um, total, then in my opinion, what we should kind of be looking at. And this isn't like a hard metric. It'd be more like a once Hadley hits five case counts. At that point, I think that the school board and the administration would need to contact the Board of Health for further guidance to determine, similar to school transmission data, if there's really a problem or not, right? Because you might have those five cases and they all might be isolated to a nursing home. So we're in this red zone, but do we really need to be worried about it at that point? So I guess what I've looked at with, with all the metrics, and I can share, I can pull up the metrics from Amherst, which my suggestions are a little bit different from them, is looking at, at four different venues, um, school transmission data, percent positivity, 
the case count, um, looking at new cases, um, and then looking at Hadley, but not having that be a definitive reason to stay open or close, but more of a point of discussion if we need to be worried or not. And I absolutely find it very important to have the Board of Health involved um, as far as recommendations and considerations at this point. I think that you need somebody who is, um, who is well equipped to be able to give um, their medical expertise on whether or not they think the actions are appropriate, if that makes sense. Um, so I looked at also um, percent positivity and Amherst is the one who kind of listed where they were at with numbers. And the reason that I, I think I had brought it up before, the reason that 5% makes me nervous is because where we are right now, right? So if we go with 5% and we are, I forget, the other day I looked it up and we were at 1.1% as of the 19th. And that was the weekly data that was put out. I don't know what percent positivity we're at right now, but 1.1% for the county. And that's a downward trend. And the state was at 1.5%. And that's a downward trend. So if we go just strictly with a 5% um, testing positivity, that means we could have a four to five time increase in our counts. And I'm just, I'm just not sure if that's safe looking at the numbers in Western Mass versus other parts of the state who already have um, testing positivities much higher than our area. Like, you know, for instance, Amherst chose that 3% and, and actually... Um, I think Cambridge also chose 3% interestingly enough. And so that at that point, you have a much more narrow um, positivity rather than looking at a percent um, uh, uh, rate of change in percentages as you go up, which is really hard to, to narrow down um, recommendations for. Um, if you go with a more narrow percent, then I don't think you need to look at change in rate of testing positivity. Does that make sense? Yes. I know I'm kind of all over the place with my thoughts. I'm really bad at explaining my thought process and I had it all worked out nice and clear. And then when I have to talk, I get kind of nervous. Um, so basically there's no statistical power in our town. So we just cannot, um, we don't have an adequate population density. See, I wrote notes to make sure I said it appropriately. We don't have an accurate, uh, adequate population density to create metrics that would be um, accurate, accurate or relevant with our town. So we have to extrapolate for Hampshire County. It's just not accurate. And that's why I said that five cases would be kind of that threshold at five cases with a town of, um, with a population at five, uh, 5,000. Um, we'd be in the red zone too quick too quick and it might not be helpful. And I don't think it's helpful given that our intent is really to get the schools open. So the other thing I did was I just looked at because I thought, well, people might be concerned with 3% when the state looks at 5%, right? Well, why would you go down to 3%? Well, I've looked at our numbers and, I, and because the state just recently changed over the way that they're doing it, I can only get the unless I missed it, um, I could only get the county data for the past couple of weeks as far as percent positivity. And prior to that, I've looked at the state. So it's trended generally downwards since the beginning of July, where on July 8th, it was 2.25%, July 29th, 1.74%. Again, that's the state. And then the 19th, 1.5%. So I don't think it's unreasonable to say to put ourselves at a 3% limit with those other measures in place to make sure that we're really being safe. Um, because I feel like if we end up going above any of those thresholds, then we really should be a little more concerned. That makes sense at all, anybody? Yes, and Heather, may I, um, just so I make sure Tara, uh, that I took good notes. Um, that multifactorial approach. So you're talking percent positivity in the yep. county, not in Hadley. Your percent positivity rate is in the county, correct? Yep. And I'm in suggesting less than 3%. And again, that's over a 14 yep. day average. A 14 day average percent positivity countywide. You are correct. Yep. You could not have gotten it before. They didn't add it to that. Table. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so they just added it recently because we asked them to add it to it recently. Mm -hmm. Um, and then case count over the last 14 days. I did a seven Canada, day, right? Um, it was a seven so day. You did a seven day. I'm also just wondering, so would you be pulling from two different data sources 
then. So let me, it's okay if I share this screen. Uh, yep. The one that I'm, well, let's, let me try to find it. This will be fun for everybody. Terry, you get nervous when you don't have notes. I get nervous when I do something in Zoom. Um, let's see. Let's help. What I was kind well, of in this, to. In this count, case count that we're referencing, are, is this county or Hadley case count? Because you had some specifics around Hadley yeah. case count. County. Yeah, I'm, so county, this is something that is actually a link within our district plan and it's easily accessible on the DPH website. This is the final page. So this is as of August 19th, which is where you see county data. Yep. And each of these, so I was asking, and these same columns exist also for towns. I'm just going to scroll up to Hadley. So every single town is listed. Um, and that's why I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding you. Let me make sure I get to Hadley. So there is total case count. There's case count in the last 14 days. This of course is not applicable. If there's been a change test and then uh, percent positivity, the percent positivity, this final column here, you're saying, look at the county, which is the same thing county. Dr. Allen said, because yeah. you have to have at least 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. The case count, if you refer to last seven days, that just means we have to go to a different table. This here we is could do, we could do, I mean, you I could go to a different table or you can do 14 but, days and just extrapolate it. So what I'm doing is kind of using the Harvard Global, Global Health Institute recommendations mm -hmm. um, and just kind of pulling it out and using that information to look at our data. So you could do it over a 14 day. I, they, re they report it as a 14 day. Yeah. I mean, I don't see why we couldn't. So that's, I'm just also, I've said a place where how, whatever the school committee decides, these metrics just to remind people, the school committee will be doing this every two weeks looking at this. But I also just want to make sure that whatever the school committee is looking at, the public can easily, can access easily uh, without having to kind of do their own calculations necessarily. I mean, there's mm -hmm. nothing to prevent them from doing that, but they can see themselves and not necessarily wait for school mm -hmm. committee to report. So when you look at the um, case count for Hampshire County that you have up there, I yeah. think it said, I think it said 64. Yep. I'll go down to counties. Counties are on the last page of this. Yeah. If people are looking, so you go beyond the towns, or maybe not the last, there we go. There's our county. And yeah. Hampshire County, 64 case count in the last 14 days, average daily. And then that's what you were correct. You said, I think 1. it's 1. 1.1. It is 1.1. 1. 1. And you're right about two weeks, be right before they did this, and we got the email from DPH, it was 1.5. So by that means, I mean, we're meeting these measures, right? I mean, I don't, I don't mean to say though that I think it's important to open the schools now. We've already determined why we're waiting to open the schools. So that's not the point of discussion. It's just a more of where we are now to be able to track where we're going to be in six weeks, looking at this data now and tracking it every two weeks to make sure that the trends are correct and having an, an absolute number to be able to help guide us. So those two things are absolute, right? And then one final thing, just because yep. uh, I think it's important for people. We had also, and I still haven't heard back from um, DPH, but I know that they're swamped. We had asked that question, when, even when we were at 1.5%, it seemed like if we went from 1.5 to even if we didn't hit 5%, but we were at 4.8, we more than doubled in a six week period, which seems pretty alarming, even though it's still under five. Right. So you're saying by making that 3%, that also takes into consideration that six weeks from now, we may be under 5%, but we, if we have tripled uh, our percent positivity, you're saying that that would, would certainly make you uncomfortable if I'm hearing you correctly. I am. You are. I mean, you are. But then the important part that I think to point out is that it's not just one thing that we're looking at. It's, so it's, not, out tonight. <laughs> um, it's not just one thing that we're looking at to use to make our decisions. Because like we said, if we look at just Hadley's case count, it might not be accurate. If we look at just school transmission data, it might not be mm -hmm. accurate. So by looking at all these different areas, we're making sure that the decision that we're making is the most appropriate decision um, and the safest decision for the school. Um, I can tell you that I did, because I know I brought up Amherst and I did, I looked, I looked long and hard on um, their phase reopening. Um, so their reopening for September has the two metrics, um, the percent positivity and the case count. 
um, they add on a third metric for their phasing in. And their third metric um, is, I think it was 30, um, uh, less than 33% increase in numbers over two weeks, I think it was. I don't have it up. Like, right. a, like a rate of change. It was, it was like a rate of change. but And, and I like that idea because that's what I was suggesting before. I want to look at a rate of change, which is why I was hoping we'd have some information from the DPH. But I just can't figure out where they came up with that 33%. To know if it's, I'm not saying they're not unreasonable. I'm sure they have a, a, a valid source for using it. I just couldn't figure it out to definitively be able to come to the group and say, this is why I think we should use this. And if I find it, I can suggest it, but yeah. But that's why I'm saying that I think if we use something more, more narrow, like a 3%, I don't know that we really need to look at rate change in my opinion. But again, I think we should still make sure that our metrics make sense to um, um, the Board of Health liaison mm -hmm. and that that sounds reasonable to them. Um, what, and then what, one question I just, I'm sorry, I know I'm taking up a lot of time. Uh, one question that I really did, um, if I can just comment. So I think that school choice, we should be able to capture that in our school transmission data. I know that there's a small population of it. So we don't really need to worry about them not being captured residentially in town. So we'll be able to capture that in the school transmission data. So that doesn't bother me. Um, I hadn't even thought about the colleges at all to know if that's a concern or not. But I mean, if we're, I don't know if that's something where we can find out positive test numbers, if it's going to be public data. Um, that we can find out where colleges are, what their percent positivity is, if that's something we can find out. I don't, I don't know. I would think I that's a, a question for Board of Health as well as um, you know, we could ask Amherst School Committee because they're dealing with the same thing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but I mean, and, and what um, Missy Aloisi had mentioned in terms of you know it being reported as their area, their place of residence. Right. Um, and I was just going to mention, Tara, number one, you don't have to apologize for talking about this because this is very <laughs> this is important stuff. And what you've brought to the table is um, specifics that is that are able to be really accessed by anyone. And that I think that what I'm hearing as we talk through this is that there's probably only one thing that would be maybe a judgment call, right? And that would be the Hadley case count as to where those are located um, and whether or not that's concerning if it's not school based, right? So, but otherwise, what I'm hearing is everything else is not um, subjective. It is uh, data that is out there. We'd have our metrics, and it really isn't uh, um, the decision is based on our thresholds. So this is Paul, I really like the decision based on thresholds and I appreciate um, all the good work. Tara, I, I must admit, I can't say I, I followed it exactly. I think it'd be helpful to see it written down, but um, I, the, the, um, the subject, subjectivity, Heather, you mentioned about the case count at school was one that I'd, I'd been thinking about. And I think there's a helpful offer from the state, these rapid testing. And I think it's specifically to get at uncertainty about uh, where transmission might be coming from. So maybe that's something we can acknowledge as well, that if we find ourselves in that state where we think there might be uh, in-school transmission, I, I think there's some protocols about how you have to talk to your local board of health and the, the state about it, but we would access them potentially to come out and do uh, a rapid assessment for us. I think that'd be helpful as well. I will say, Ed, Tara, I guess I see this a little bit maybe more simplistically. What's the risk in the community in which we live? What's the risk in the school? And for me, those two metrics that Annie mentioned, sort of that rate of positivity of the, the county basis and then a case count within the school and exploring what that means was sufficient for me. Um, and I, I, whether that rate of positivity at the county level is three or 5%. I'm, I'm willing to discuss that. CDC, WHO, state, they talk about 5%. That's been kind of the standard since the WHO published their document on May 12th. Uh, CDC has sort of followed on that 3%. I get the, the reason there. Um, it's really just a subjectivity. To me, it's about risk tolerance. Um, you know, if we're, 
over the last month, had, there's been 1,654 tests in Hadley, and there's been two positive cases, so 0.12%. So I acknowledge that we're not Hadley's not an NBA bubble, uh, but I'd say you know a good 80% of our kids are Hadley based. And so if you look at the rest of the the Hampshire County, right at 1.1%, even at a tripling, you're still at 3%. So you're still below the CDC and the WHO uh, levels. So. I'm willing to talk about if we want to do three or five percent. I, I like the idea of just two simple metrics that we can point to and say to the the public because I think there's a communication and a planning, right? As Lindsay mentioned before, sort of this the hardship of not having school open on parents. So if we can be clear as we are revisiting these things, here are the two metrics we're looking for. Everybody else can see them. You can monitor them. So there's no guess that comes week six, if school's gonna move into the next phase or not, it'd be very clear based on those data. And people will know at week four, they'll know the trend from week one. Um, and so I just worry that if we have four or five different metrics we're monitoring, it gets really confusing. And if three are met and not the fourth or not the fifth, that, you know, how do we make that decision? It just adds another layer of complexity. But I'm not sure if we're really just doing a simple risk assessment. What's the risk in which the community in which we live? What's the risk in the school? That's really what matters. And in fact, you know, it really does kind of come down to me. What's the risk in the school is the biggest one. But we, we don't live in a bubble. We live in a community. So um, I would advocate just for the two simple metric approach. And if we want to dis discuss whether it's three or five percent positivity at the county basis, um, I'm happy to, to chat about those. I just rebuttal just so that um, I just just something to say to my immune, just something to say to that. The reason that I don't think we should only use testing positivity is because testing positivity is only as good as we're testing, right? So if we're not testing a lot, then your testing positivity percentage goes up a lot. The more you test, the more um, people are being tested, not just symptomatic sick people that are going. The more that we test, the lower the rate is likely going to be. So somebody who may be asymptomatic who is exposed or whatnot. So testing positivity in and of itself is only as good as we're testing uh, testing people. So then when you add in that other layer of looking at actual case count, you're at least getting a finite number to know that finite number of how much more, how much more positive tests there are. That's my only reason for not wanting to look at just testing positivity. And I think this, to me, that's sort of, are we, the numbers are still so low. I'm not so worried about how that hypersensitivity is. I mean, if you had 7,500 tests in Hampshire County alone over the last uh, 14 days, that is, you know, 5%, 4.5% of the population tested. So yeah, I agree. We're not, we're not going to, I wish we were at a much higher rate of testing. I don't think we're going to get there at a much higher rate of testing anytime soon. So if we're testing four to 5% of the population, we're back at 1% positive. Um, I guess, what's the metric? What is the sensitivity where we think we're missing or that we wouldn't capture in the other metric of, are we seeing in school transmission? A question on case count too, and maybe um, Tara or Paul, you know this, but has that been, I guess, are, are we working with definitions that from here on out are gonna be fixed or do we anticipate like changes in these things? Cause I feel like, you know, there's been, I'll call it discrepancies in the data that once you uncover it, it's, oh, we're calculating it differently or we've changed essentially, right, the definition of how, how this is reported. It can, do we know, I guess, do we feel confident that these, these metrics that we would pick at this point are defined clearly and um, should they change that we would be revisiting our own process as well? So I think I, we'll only, so. go ahead, yeah. uh, I was going to say, I think one thing, what keeps it simple for me is there are just two things that you're talking about measuring rate of community transmission and rate of school transmission that we hope is zero. Right. And so those are the two things we're looking at, whether or not how we measure those, I would say there is a chance that there may be more precise ways to assess the extent to which those things are happening. So I certainly don't want to see 
every week we're talking about something different, I think it's important for the public to understand we are always talking about these two things. Is community transmission happening? Is there evidence of school transmission? The way in which we measure that, so we look at different sets of data. I would say that um, that data, and I think this was your point, one of your points, Tara, that for example, when you said a case count of five in Hadley, we saw an, in, a, a, an increase, an additional five cases, an increase of five case count in Hadley over a 14 day period. That could be alarming, it's data, um, but it isn't information until you look at it more deeply. Did it all happen at a nursing home, right? So I also just caution too that I, I very much agree. It's important to be clear on what we're measuring and wherever we start with. So if we said one of the ways that we measure community transmission is through testing positivity rates for Hampshire County, they're currently at 1.1%. They cannot, they have to be at or less than three or 5%. If DPH tells us there's a rate of change that's unacceptable, we would also add that, but that's one layer for community transmission. When analyzing community transmission, we will take into consideration case count for the specific town and take that into consideration. Maybe to your point, it is hard to set a hard and fast number for that. So you could say three or 5%, whatever it's going to be for, for testing positivity, and for case count, you say that's data, but we have to dig a little deeper for information. Your example of asking the Board of Health, what does this mean? Where did it happen? And what are the what are the implications, right? Is it uh, an increase in cases in a relatively contained space like a nursing facility, skilled nursing facility? Doesn't mean it can't lead there. Those are the kinds of questions we would ask. And then the second part, school transmission, that is, as we've said, would require the clinical judgment of a team of people that would then report back to the school committee. Um, so I think I think there are things that can be fixed definite right now. And um, I think that over time, we may be informed of more precise ways to answer the question, do we have a problem with community transmission, right? And if we're provided more precise ways of answering that question, then I think of course, we would seize that way of answering the question and, and change how we are approaching it if the information were better. Are there any concerns with our ability to get that kind of um, Hadley case count information? No, because I'll do this again, because whoops, let me try one more time. Um, no, because it, am I still on mute? No, okay. no, we hear you. Oh my gosh, I swear. Um, okay, because, it is um, publicly available uh, every, published this every two weeks, right? Every 14 days. Right. But oh, no, every week. Do they publish it every week? Yeah. Every Wednesday it comes out. It's okay. more the, the digging deeper part. Are we, are we able to get that information about whether those cases were um, contained to a specific population or facility or those? I, I agree that I think those things are important. I just, I'm, I'm not positive that we will be able to get that information. I can ask the Board of Health that directly. I, so, um, so to be clear, I, I guess I was thinking, thinking about, I mean, Missy's point about college students, if there are 500 college student renters in at UMass Amherst, uh, living in Hadley, I know U UMass, there's a dashboard at, on the UMass website and the Amherst College website. I'm just not sure that the college students who are not back living on campus, who are here on their own accord because they signed a lease for a year and are living out, out of a, you know, a two bedroom house on West Street or Middle Street or wherever, that that's going to be data that's available to us. I, if UMass doesn't have it and those numbers are going back to Boston or Iowa, then I'm not sure that it is an accurate picture. And, th but, and therefore, I believe that like more data is better than less data. So unfortunately, if that's the case, and I hadn't heard that, if that's unfortunately the case, then we'll see it reflected in the community data, right? The rest of us will get sick, unfortunately. So I don't know how, I mean, I, we could try to fix the UMass problem. I don't know what to do about that. But so Tara, maybe I didn't understand. So, so I kept looking at, we have a community metric that's in this table that everybody can see on a weekly basis. How are we doing? Whether three or 5%, we can debate that. 
that's a metric. And then the in-school thing, which we would talk about. And um, what were your other metrics you wanted to use? So um, the two very objective met metrics are, are both listed in the DPH, the case count and the percent positivity. So they're both right there in the document. So Annie has it up, for instance. For, for Hadley or the county? Both. Both? both. both? Hadley? Yep. Yeah. So you'd have, case, you'd have case count for Hadley, percent yep. positivity Hadley, case count for the uh, county. For the county. Count for the county. And then in school transmission, you'd have five metrics? Four. Two for Hadley, two for the county, and then the school? So no, you would look at percent positivity for the county. There's no point in looking at percent positivity for the town. So percent positivity for the county. And then I was looking at case count for the county and then case count for the town and then school transmission data. And what did the case and count so get? The point, the point behind looking at the case count for the for the county and not just for the town is because we we are not an isolated bubble. So there is a lot of fluid movement, especially between Amherst, Northampton, Hadley. There's a lot of movement. So that was my thought in looking at case count for um, the county as well. So you're you're basically saying if we stick to that principle of we have two things we're looking at community transmission and school transmission right community though we're now defining community transmission as percent positive county case count county and case count town that's what i'm hearing that those three things make up the definition of community transmission data which are all easily and readily available on the dph that annie has yeah here. And we would need to do that just because of the sheer uh, lack of number, lack of size within Hadley alone. But that's why I think it's important to still look at Hadley. And then if, if possible, and I realized that it might not be possible to get specific data. And that was a concern that I had, but that's where I was hoping we could talk to the board of health to find out maybe it's not necessarily that we really need the information on the specific cases. Right. But it's more going to them and saying, do we need to be concerned? They might not tell us specifically where though they're not gonna say, oh yeah, that happened at Linda Manor. They're all five right there. We don't need to worry about that, but they can tell us. Um, and I, I feel we can trust their recommendation as to whether or not it's something we really need to worry about. Like, is it erroneous or is it relevant? And then how do you set the acceptable case counts? So what I was using, um, what I was using was from the, um, Harvard Global Health Institute. It was in one of those links that I had sent out. They have a graph um, that a uh, uh, graph of the United States that you can narrow it down into state and then further by um, county. But that's what I was saying. That caveat in the beginning is that you, I, I wouldn't want to use the data that they put on there because their data is not updated as quickly as the DPH would be. So more or less using it as kind of like their principles behind it. So their principles behind it, we're really looking at um, their levels of concern. So again, they use the color coded system, but really looking at what they've calculated out for their levels of concern. So green being less than one case, yellow being one to nine cases, orange being 10 to 24 cases per 100,000 people and using that like as a baseline. So then I kind of looked at it too. When you say 10 to 24, I chose the lower end of the threshold at 10 when I looked at it, just because of where Western Mass is. We're already kind of low count. So I mean, is it really reasonable to go with the higher end of the threshold? I don't, to be honest, if we continue on the track that we're at, I feel like we'd be able to meet these measures. It's reasonable. So we're measuring something, we have quantifiable, data to look at we have places to refer back to where we're getting it from and i still think it's reasonable in our small town to be able to move forward in phases that's 10 cases a day yeah. well I, I was going to say perhaps i can give an example that would be helpful for the school committee so you're looking at this every two weeks and you're looking at potentially moving from one phase to an, to the next every six weeks so in six weeks you've seen three of these reports and so it may be that one of the things that's catching your attention, so you ask yourself every time, what do I see and what does it mean? And so if every, every report you've seen shows on the county level and on the town level that you have a relative change in case counts that's higher, the next report says higher, that means higher than the previous 14 days. And the next one said higher, 
right? So each one has been higher. What do you see and what does it mean? It means in every single one of those reports, your relative change in case count has increased, right? Not only just from that place six weeks out, but in each one potentially it's increased, right? So it doesn't get, while you're asking a really important question, like what is that number of case count? I'm not providing you an answer to that, but I am saying that I do think it is useful in looking at these reports, looking at that column. And if you saw every two weeks that this is that this has gone up, that every report you've seen it's higher, 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 that certainly says something, whether, right, that, that there's something happening in the county that maybe would cause the school committee to say, do we stay where we are? That doesn't necessarily mean with that data, you say, well, we're gonna shut everything down, but does it say, do we stay where we are? As opposed to um, introducing more movement into the schedule, right? Introducing more cohort mixing, which is what happens in each phase. I think um, we just wanna be very clear about if what we're looking at then is really trends um, and we're saying that we're gonna make a decision based on a positive, uh, unfortunately positive trend and increase uh, in these counts that again, we're, we're trying to make this um, definable, right? For everybody so that we can say either positive or negative trend. But I think uh, we wanna be able to defend that decision about if we continue to see positive trends, no matter what that is, if that's what we're saying, it doesn't matter what that number is, what the, the magnitude of that is, regardless, it's positive over the last three. So that's gonna influence our decision. The only concern I have with just looking at that, and I think that it's a good starting point, but but if your positive trend and you're looking at your relative change in case amounts goes up by two case counts every week, is that really relevant? I don't know that that's relevant because then our threshold would say, well, yes, it's going up, but it's not going up at an exponential rate that we need to be concerned about it yet. Right. I just... I Tara, I'm just not sure about the case counts, whether it's really needed. That just seems we, we're first going to have to then decide what's an acceptable level of case count based on some subjective nature. And I guess there's a lot of subjectivity to where there's 3% positivity or 5%. It really comes down to risk tolerance. Um, you know, if you look at the last month and there's 1,654 tests in Hadley, if those are Hadley residents, maybe because the data goes to wherever you're living, then they're heavily residents. That's a third of the population were tested in the last four weeks. It's a pretty high rate. Of, I mean, obviously we want more testing and, and who knows if those are the people are testing. Just to be clear, Amherst isn't looking at, I don't think Amherst is looking at their, um, town data at all. They're simply looking at counties. So they're looking yeah. at county case yeah. count. And they've weighted the counties too, right? Given from where they oh, dropped right. in. Yeah. Because half of their half of their towns are in Franklin. So they have to they have to weight it. Yeah. So what so would we what would we lose by if we didn't look at case case count for the county, would we lose information about the school choice population coming in? Would we lose information about the surrounding towns with um, college kids and testing. I, I'm just, I'm throwing the question out there about what information do we lose if we don't look at case count for, by the county? I don't see what you lose that's not reflected in the percentage positive. And what we wouldn't have is the additional information that the Board of Health might be able to give us on case count for the town, right? We wouldn't have that for case count for the county. Right, so we wouldn't have like the added context of a major outbreak in a in a facility. Yeah, correct. It's just for trending. And then, what would be the metrics? You know, for again, if we've been we've been zero for the since it's been a while, right? It's been the last three cycles or um, three weeks. We, last case was the week of July 29th. Right, and we've had uh, over a thousand tests since then, and they've all been negative. And it just just Hadley. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. If we one case, or if we suddenly get into a red, because but I thought the red had a minimum of more than five. It's always less than five in that metric, right? So suddenly, if we're at ten cases, maybe there's a spike, maybe there was an event, maybe there's a UMass party. We may or may not know about that apparently now. So maybe there's at someplace else. But yeah, I pre and then we can sort of dive into well, what does that mean? Have we seen any in-school transmission uh, commensurate? Seems like a fair three-level approach. We would just need to talk about what's the what's the rate in the Hadley elevation that we would want to monitor. Do we want to monitor as a trend, week over week, or as a total case amount? Because we're at zero, so the total case amount is, you know, it's going to be pretty low. You monitor trends with a, a. I mean, you're not going to the numbers that we're pulling from Hadley, like the reason that I was suggesting case count in Hadley is partially because they have this, this map that's put out that puts you in the red zone, but because Hadley is less than a hundred thousand people, we can't really look at anything except just sheer point numbers. Like it's just literally the number of cases. So then yeah. at what point is that a problem? Like how can you can't, there's no, there's no way to say we're getting X percent rate of increase because our numbers that we're using are just not statistically significant. Well, I mean, you can do it a week over to week, right? And, but again, we've been at zero for three weeks. So oh, if we get one case next week, it's a pretty dramatic increase, right? So um, you could do it. You'd have to do trend or because if you did total numbers, it would just seem to be arbitrary. If we said 10 in Hadley over a week, that's a dramatic spike. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know. I guess that's where I'd want um, the Board of Health to weigh in because I don't know if it's it's accurate data to look at trends that way. Like, it's just case in point when you're looking at the town data just because our population is so small. Like, but I just this, is, this is, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's just raw data. So what I'm trying to support you here, Terry. You're the one who said you wanted case count by town. And so you would have to have some way to understand what that is, how that means that means to us. I, I pulled out the raw data for the last five weeks from uh, DPH and, and graphed it out. And yeah, it's low. If we're going to go just by town data, I don't know how else you do it other than trend or, you know, like a three week rolling average uh, or just total numbers. Say we don't want more than one a day, which I think some folks have, you know, a certain number per day. And yeah, and I am in support of looking at the the case counts again because the map puts it out, but I don't think we can do a rolling average because we don't have sufficient population in order to do an accurate number for that. That's my point. That's why I'm thinking that if we have, you know, um, Dr. Mosler, Mosler, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, weigh in on if that's really an accurate number because we can't be reporting these what we're going to be referring to is kind of statistical data if we don't have the population to do it. It's not going to be accurate. I, I, but how do you how do you understand why it's inaccurate? I'm telling you the number of cases that have been tested in Hadley and the number of positive results. That's because of our accurate. because of our population size, we don't have a but high it, enough population. It's not density dependent. It's density independent. This number is is zero percent of tested. You're saying the number of tests towards population is density dependent, and that is not representative. If you're going to give a seven-day rolling average, you need to have the appropriate number of of of. Uh, no, it's not. You know, it's it's independent of the size of the population. It's more dependent. It's only strictly dependent on the number of tests and the rate of positivity. But if you want to say that that's not that thousand people over the last three weeks, those thousand tests is not representative of the population. That's a separate question. So I guess what I'm saying is I would just want to weigh in. So again, I, I, I think I was looking at it differently than you are. I think I'd want to weigh in with Dr. Mosler to see if she thinks that that would be an appropriate way to look at it. If we're going to assess that data week to week, is that an appropriate way to look at it or every two weeks? I'd just be hesitant to ask her that question because I'm not really sure what it means. It's inappropriate. I, I guess I, I, I still don't understand. I don't see if there's any density relationship here from those numbers. I'm, I'm wondering if this is a difference in either definition or how we're looking at those numbers. So it, maybe to be clear, could we model this like and say, all right, if we took the last two weeks, um, this is what it would look like. This is what our dashboard would look like using these things. And this is what we would apply. And based on this, can we agree that we're all reading it in the same way? Because that way, at least we'd all be on the same page as to if it's pure case count, like number of people positive test in Hadley. And last week it was last two weeks, it was zero. And now it's one, 
you know, that, or whatever, that we all agree, okay, it means this. It, this is the change, one case, which we're not really, I don't think, saying a percent. We're saying a pure case count. So if you're wondering what are the things you would see visually, if you're, if you're just looking at pure colors, right? And if you decided if it were three or 5%, whatever your threshold is. So you're testing positivity countywide. If it were below that threshold, that would be green. Your um, school transmission, the absence of school transmission, no evidence to suggest we have a problem with school transmission, that would be green. Right, so right now that would be green, it's NA, it's not happening. Your county would be green. Um, and if you were looking at case counts, because people will see one visual representation of case counts, as soon as Hadley has five or more cases in a 14 day period, that will turn red. So just in the thing that everybody looks at that's on DPH's website, that will turn red. The minute there are five in the four previous 14 days. So you could have green, green, red, for example, or you could have, now we're at 3% countywide um, and we have five in Hadley, we could have a red, red, no example of school at this point, green. So those, those would be just ways when you're talking about visually seeing this and one of those things, it is case count that everybody in the community will have access to and we'll see every week if they choose. They just have to go on DPH's website and they can see what color Hadley is every week. I think that's good. If you, I mean, if there's a standard by the state at five, then albeit it's arbitrary, but it's out there, we might as well use it. And if they're going to be drawing red colors on maps, we might as well adhere to it. So <clears throat> those three metrics would be, Tara, you would have total case count in the state. And that would be by that map, there would be percent positivity in the county, Hampshire County. Um, and there would be the in-school transmission. Wait, so say, gotta, say it again. So you'd have the, in, the percent positivity at the county, the Hampshire County level. And, and granted, there's, I think, 1.5% of the population of our schools that are outside Hampshire County. But maybe for we'd capture the vast majority in um, with the Hampshire County percent positivity. You'd have the town case count, because I agree with you, Heather, or Tara, that the percent positivity at the town is, is skewed since the sample size is low there. I think that is density dependent. Um, but it, case count is to me density independent, but there's a map with the, the state that if we go above five, we're in the red zone. And then there's the in-school transmission, which we've said basically any in-school transmission or suspected in-school transmission will be investigated, assessed whether there truly was in-school transmission. We potentially would call the state to have the rapid response team come out and, and help us make that assessment and do the, the rapid testing. So you're getting a county, a town and a school level and it's very transparent. We, and I like your idea, Heather, we could set up a, a metric in that that we're constantly revising as new state data comes out. It's, that seems sound to me because I think it also acknowledges the map that um, many people will be looking at. And should we turn red, yet we are still open, we have um, a, a reason behind that as to what everything that we are looking at. Yeah. And do we say all those metrics need to be met to go from one phase to the next? I mean, what if there is, we turn red in the, the, the town, but realize it's a totally unrelated event. It's in one particular community. I would probably take the Board of Health's recommendation on this one as to, you know, is two out of three? I, I don't know. I guess I don't I'm, know. I'm hesitant. I don't think that's a medical decision. I think it's a risk tolerance decision. And I think that's our job. I don't think it's their job. They can advise us, but I think we should decide. I, th I just want to say that I think a lot of it depends on where those cases are coming from. I know we've talked about like, are they coming from Linda Manor or whatever? I mean, if we see that all the cases are coming from there and that's why we're red. I mean, I don't know if we can get that information, but it seems like if we are red with regard to town cases, and that's the only one that we're read. I'd, I'd want to know where those cases are coming from. Um, just because it would, that would be really helpful in terms of deciding, you know, what, what so, Ethan, if it's a, it's a, an event that's unrelated to the school isolated, we don't think there's continued community transmission that would affect your decision and how you think it affects the schools reopening to a second phase. Well, I, I guess I'm thinking that if we're going to go by town data and we know that that data is going to be so small, um, 
or at least let's hope that it's going to be small, that if we can extract where those cases are coming from, I think it could provide some context and at least give us more of a sense of what's happening in our town. Because if we're going to, if we're, if we're going with this town metric, um, I, I'd want to know more about those cases as much as we could know about those cases so that that could help inform our decision. Then I just don't know what we can get from, from the town about those cases. Hi, Dr. Mosler. Hi. hi. Right on time. Sorry, it took me a while to negotiate the website. So I'm not sure what, what portion you've heard here, but... Um, I haven't heard anything. I just signed them. So where, where we're at is it looks like um, in establishing our um, data that we're going to look at, uh, for reviewing our reopening plans and moving into phases. Um, the first one we would look at is the percent positivity for the county, which is on the um, dashboard that Annie had brought up previously. We would uh, second look at a case count for the town, which is what the state is using in our town, uh, DESE, I should say the maps, that if we turn red, uh, they, right? right? Um, but there's kind of a part two to that in that we might want to know more information about that case count should, should hypothetically Hadley case count increases were read on the map and come to find out those cases were isolated to a nursing home in town and that there might be, uh, and we would only know that information through board of health and discussion uh, with you and that the information might help us in determining whether that is a broader concern for community and school spread. Uh, and then the third piece of information we would look at is in-school transmission data, which we've talked about some of the options that we might have around that regarding uh, rapid testing as a way to contain, um, should that be a problem? That's kind of where I think as a recap that we are at right now. The, the rapid testing, you mean the state provided rapid testing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't know if you're uh, aware, Dr. Mosler, but for the from for schools now, if there's a if you have suspected school transmission, you can request the mobile unit. To yes, I, I think that's terrific. Yeah. So that because we recognize that school transmission really is a we've said this repeatedly, and I think it's really important for parents in the community to understand this that just the positive case count in a school does not necessarily mean that there is school transmission. And that's a clinical judgment that uh, folks such as yourself, our school nurses uh, with DPH's help and contact tracing, um, that's part of that work of trying to investigate and determine if that's happening. Yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. I mean, is what, you know, what I see is uh, when the state identifies a positive case in Hadley, we get an email to the Board of Health. And then um, uh, Emma Dragon, uh, it, there's a link to Maven, which is the uh, Massachusetts, which is their tracking tool. I do not have access to Maven, you know, because it's, it's confidential information. So we just have one person. And she goes on to Maven and she can see you know, the age and the address and, you know, and, and get more details. We are not doing our own contact tracing anymore. We are turning it over, everything over to the state. Uh, they have uh, a lot of people power. Um, they hired and trained uh, a very large uh, cater of uh, contact tracers. So they are doing our contact tracing. Um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, Emma, I, I w we would have to check with her. I don't know if there's, you know, if any of this information, of course, a name, specific name would be HIPAA uh, protected, but I don't know if just the information itself that there are positive cases, I don't think that that's uh, protected information. So Emma would, would be able to track that. In other words, the, the positive cases in Hadley. 
Yeah, it seems like, I mean, positive cases in Hadley is public information here on the on the state's dashboard, but right. it would be more that, that additional information about whether the location of those positive cases might be um, at, uh, the school population families. That, I mean, we're just trying to assess risk here. Well, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I mean, if there's an outbreak at a nursing home, uh, or in a senior apartment complex that would have different implications for you uh, in the school community. So I completely understand that. I, you know, I can't imagine that Emma couldn't share that information with you. But like I said, I, I, I can't, you know, I don't want to speak for her and then, you know, have it turn out differently. But um, uh, I can call her now. I mean, is this, is this a big... Uh, is this important for you guys to know right now? Well, I think, um, I, I don't think you have to call her right now. I think what okay. we can do here is agree upon the, the metrics we want to use, um, agree upon ideally what, you know, what we'd like to explore regarding the town um, case counts. And then if we can have more information for our meeting next Monday uh, on whether or not that's even feasible, it seems like what we're looking for is just um, context around that case count, not specifics, not any kind of privacy violation, but more of a, a population context. Con contacts, are you saying, or context? Context. Okay. So, Sorry, my yeah. hearing was a good No thing. worries. Because, you know, the contact tracing is also all, uh, you know, confidential. Um yeah, I don't imagine that that would be a problem, but I'd be happy to get in touch with Emma tomorrow and uh, and get back to you. That'd be great. It would be good to know what our options are with that because I'd hate for us to assume that we could dig into the town data, you know, any further if that's not an option, which it may not be. Right. All right. Well, let me uh, check with her. And again, what you're interested in would be basically the demographic of the positive case. Yes. And can I, can I build on that? I mean, really what we're just looking for is a recommendation from the Board of Health as to whether or not we should be worried or not, what, based on like whether it's um, isolated or more widespread. And I don't, I don't know if you have the ability to see, okay, these are, um, these are families with school-age children, so yeah, you should be worried. Heather, Tara, is it safe I, to say that we're really just looking for whether we should be worried or not? Well, I, I think it's, we, you know, we can't put you guys on the spot to tell us whether or not we should be worried, but it's more, we're trying to be very black and white about this data and about um, being very transparent about what metrics we're using and the go, no go decision of moving into our next phase, right? And so based on that and recognizing the small population numbers that we have within Hadley and the very public facing uh, map they, that may put us in red. Uh, we're just trying to understand how much more context we could have around the nature of the cases in our town. Um, and so while it does ultimately mean should, be we, should we be worried because this is not isolated to a nursing home, to a senior apartment uh, living complex, it, yeah, I think that's going to factor into our decision, but we're trying to make this decision not um, subjective and more really based in the data. And I will also say the dashboard does produce um, where those, um, so it'll have a nursing facility and caseload as well. Right, I haven't read so much paid attention to that, but maybe there's something in there that's already publicly in that dashboard. Yeah, the only other thing I would just add is, you know, certainly if there's a positive case and they have school-aged children, the school will find out. I mean, the school will be contacted by the contact tracers. You know, if a child has had, you know, meets the definition of a close contact with a positive case, you're going to find out pretty quickly. Correct? Okay. Uh, yes, Dr. Mozart, we are going to find out quickly, but I want to be careful when I say we. Um, the school nurses are going to find out quickly, right? That's also important that people understand, have, have an understanding, which I think most people do, but don't expect to get information that 
even I don't necessarily get. So whenever there's something, whenever there's something with health in the schools, I, I don't get the child's name. I don't get that stays with the nurse. No, no. Right. Made, I know you know that, Dr. Mose. I just want to be what people in the public to be clear. Yeah. Right. That I, I didn't I don't know even get to that's know, that's nor that's should that's I, that's I, the first and last name of a child with any sort of illness. I, I don't get to know that, right? So I get to be informed and I get recommendations from clinical folk, but I just, I know you know that Dr. Mozo, I just wanna be clear for the community that they do not have that expectation of, um, I would be getting first and last names and that that would somehow show up in a weekly email or something. No. I don't even get that. No, but, but the school nurse would be contacted and then the contact tracing would be applied. Yes. Absolutely. So and those closed that, contracts would be notified. And, right, yeah. so whoever that student, uh, uh, you know, wasn't where had a close contact with. So I, I, I uh, the power of interacting with the power of interacting with the board of health is if um, a large percentage of our school age children are um, school choicing to other towns, but a neighborhood of children are playing with one another. We may not know that our Hopkins or Hadley Elementary School children are um, have COVID, but you would have a be better view of whether we should be concerned. That's just my point. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's so complicated. Um, I, I think we can, you know, only hope and, and have some trust in the state that, uh, that, you know, they're going to be very uh, careful and cautious and timely. Uh, in, in their contact tracing and, and interacting with the school nurse and, and, and families. I, I mean, we, we have to trust that, that that's going to be a part of the process. So we, yeah, we, we, go ahead, Paul. So if we have three metrics that we're toying with, it sounds like, the percent positive for the county, total case count, uh, at, and we're using five as that sort of metric, below five, and then in school transmission that we've talked about, we've got three. I would offer that we follow sort of Cambridge's lead in this and given all the uncertainty surrounding that we shoot for two of the three metrics to be met at the time. Of course, we, we could caveat that and say, if we don't feel, you know, still don't feel safe, we can, um, we can deviate and we talked about that before, but because I think those, those three metrics are not all the same. If we have five in Hadley and we don't quite know why because we can't find out um, but there's some suspicions or we're starting to see you know we don't see a increase in the school transmission then we're like okay two of the three are met we feel comfortable but if the the one criterion that is increasing is the in-school transmission well clearly that's that's like the final metric right that's the ultimate metric well, I'd also argue that it's it, that should be standalone. That's the only thing I was going to say, because I know you said two out of three before. If there's evidence of school transmission, it doesn't mean like six weeks, right? But if there's evidence of school transmission, I think parents should expect and the school committee should expect that if health professional, professionals were saying to me and the nurses, there's evidence of school transmission, that school is shutting down. Well, we should break that up. Is that right? So there's one child gets sick and it's clear from another child. And it was one event that, so we'd have to assess whether that was actually in school transmission, out of school transmission. You know, maybe they were hanging out over the weekend. I'm sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't clear with, I'm not just counting, you have one, you're, you're right. The way I said that made it sound like one child gets another child sick. I'm thinking more clinically of the term transmission. Do you have, do you have more widespread transmission? Like this is something that's being passed now from one student to another. So you're right, Paul, I didn't say that clearly. I also don't know exactly at what point and right. a health official would say to me, this is, this is not looking like two kids in the class got this. You have, you have a problem. This is now spreading, right? That yeah. I'm just saying that that one metric should not require an additional metric if there were evidence that there was school transmission. Yeah. Fair enough. yeah. Can I just um, clarify something? I guess the, the way I, the way that our conversation has kind of transpired, it's really less about metrics now, it's more about criterion, right? So when I look at this, and if we're gonna look at school transmission data, which is somewhat now subjective because we're gonna take that case by case and it's gonna be a clinical, clinical judgment, it's not necessarily a, an objective measure. Um, 
we're going to look at um, town population. But again, we're going to look at that more subjectively, right? Because we're not going to necessarily say that this is the number that we're going to look at that's going to be concerning and that's where we cut it off. We're looking at it kind of subjectively. So it's not really a metric. So the only metric that we really truly have in place is our percent positivity. That's the only real objective thing that we're looking at, just to be clear. So if those are the three things that we use, those are our criteria, if you will. But we only really have one metric, and that's our percent positivity. So you know, again, you know the town will go red if in the last 14 days you have five or more. How they will go from unshaded to you have a problem. In that part, right. that's objective. What it means, the contextual understanding is subjective, right? We will assess, hey, did that all happen in one isolated nursing home? And it does not then affect our children. You're right. There's the subjectivity part there. We need to ask that follow-on question. What does it mean to be in the red? But the red itself is an objective criterion. Right. We're that not would, using that it like that, though, right? Oh, but that would, that, I mean, I guess the red would trigger the subjective part, right? Like we're going to yeah. use that data as a, like we're not going to make a decision until it turned, mm -hmm. like we wouldn't discuss it until it went red, right? And then we would discuss kind of beyond that. Right. We're going to assume that it's remaining white, which we hope it does, but it is a, um, yes, it's a criterion, but the metric is five, right? So there is an established metric but we've, what we're saying is that we want to explore that should that trigger a further discussion. And, and Tara, can I just ask you, because I know you're, you're, you're still, you, when, when you were explaining kind of the case count in the county, right? That was one of your, your points. Within that data, would we be looking at anything about that data or just strictly the numbers? Like if we hit, let's use Amherst or whatever it was, 70 out of 100,000, we would just say that that's a bad metric. So you would target a number, yeah. Right, whatever that number, yeah. X number, but again, it's a quantifiable measurement. So when we're quantifying it, we're looking at that measurement and then we're comparing it to where we were before. I just don't, I don't know that we can really use, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe that's a question more for DPH if we can really look at it that way. I'm still just looking at as we have one, objective here one objective one real true metric that we're using and i don't know if it's accurate to use hadley's case count as a true metric and why is that because of our population density still it's still about the case count versus the amount of people we have living in the town but there's no so when you extrapolate that data then you're five people over Hundred thousand becomes what number? Point one. No, no, it's just strictly not? case count. So again, it's not related to the size of the overall population. It's just the number of tests that week that turned up positive related to the number of tests the previous week that turned up positive. So it's strictly that. And so five, you're right, is a number just arbitrarily picked by the state in which they're mapping now. And you're right, it relates to our town size. So it's five out of five thousand. So sure, but when we look at a percent positivity, say we choose 3%, we're saying that's our cutoff, 3%. But when we go to look at the town data, we're saying five people. Okay, fine, we're calling that an objective number. But well, is five people really a problem? Is it not a problem? Whereas it's a definite solid with the 3%. We're not going, well, it's 3%, but do we really need to narrow that down further? It's just a strict quantitative measurement of what we're looking at to make an objective assessment. You're right. There's a bit of subjectivity because the context matters with those five in town because you're getting to a, a small town, like you said. And so we may actually know who those five people are and be able to assess it doesn't pose any risk to our, our school. And therefore, we think it's, it's acceptable to move into the second phase. I think what Annie is saying is rightfully so is the one criterion that is fixed is the in-school transmission because that is the one we're most concerned about. So if that is happening, that was sort of non-negotiable. We would say, okay, that one based on our assessment. And there's subjectivity in how we assess that, but that one is going to be a trigger that we, we will not then move into the next phase. Independent, yes. Yeah. Again, even more so, just so the community is aware, we're talking about doing this analysis every two weeks. We're talking about moving the faces. We're making assumptions that I hope come true, which is this will progress well and smoothly. But evidence of in-school transmission could mean like a snowstorm, right? 
we're, we're closing school for a period of time until we understand what's happening, right? We wouldn't necessarily wait um, for the next scheduled meeting, if that makes sense, right? If there was a recommendation from DPH, the school needed to close down, the school is closing down. Tara, um, may, maybe you would want to uh, speak directly with Emma. I absolutely can. You know, yeah, just I just rather than me be a go-between, because uh, I think you know exactly what you're looking for, and I think it would be good for you to have a conversation with her since she's the one who has access to that information. Um, if that's permissible and the school committee agrees to it, I'd be happy to get in touch with her and just talk well, about it and get some someone, clarity. Yeah, someone. I don't know who, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, if you want to do that, Tara, and if- or Heather, and, I'm sorry. I, I'm oh, getting- Oh, no, 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 I'm good. Well, Tara, I have you no idea who I'm talking <laughs> to. Anyway, if the appropriate person- A uh, representative from the school committee can talk with- uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just and, saying for, you know, to talk, I, I, I don't want, it's not a good idea, I don't think, for me to be a go-between here. I think you know exactly what you're looking for. Ask Emma if she can give you that. Moving no, that, that makes sense. I, I feel like we have a pretty solid foundation here from this discussion in terms of coming up with the, you know, the hopefully it's a first draft that can be reviewed directly with, with Emma. Um, can, let's just see if it passes muster in terms of, you know, does this seem reasonable? Does it seem like we're looking at the right metrics? Um, does it seem like we're taking into account some of the uniquenesses of our, our population and our um, size. And I, I would encourage Annie, if you can be part of that discussion, um, that would be helpful. I know you've done a lot of research on this as well. Can, can I just ask uh, one, maybe one more question about this? Um, and I'm going to point it at you, Tara, but it doesn't have to be answered by you. In your idea of using like a number of cases per 100,000, in the county, would you want to dive into those numbers at all or just wait it like Amherst does? I mean, if, if, if we said 70 and, you know, they weren't coming from our town and some of the other towns that we, that we are associated with, would that matter to you or is it just the pure numbers? Um, so I, I think when I look at it, I, I, I think that it's important to come up with a, a number that's like a threshold but as Annie has said, when you look at this table, it, it gives you a lot of information. It gives you the case count. It gives you the average daily rate incidence and the relative change in case counts, which is not a number. It just lists it as no change, lower, higher, or whatnot. So you're getting an idea, but I think you would need to have a, a threshold. I don't think you could just leave it as an open-ended because then it starts to become a little bit more subjective again. And that's for the case count for the county? I think that's what you were asking, right? Yeah, I think Ethan, that, that's what you were asking about? Yes. Yeah, my only concern with that one was, you know, and we'll, we'll see what we can um, discuss in terms of the contextualization of that information from our town. But I, I worry about how much we can dig into that county data um, beyond what might be in the papers, frankly. Yeah, I don't think I looked at it that way when it came to that because the data is is over the, the course of the county. So you're looking more at the number, whereas Hadley, it's just that small case count looking at a little more subjectively as to whether or not it, it is relevant. Whereas I was looking at the case count more as just a very objective measure, just like percent positivity. Those were more objective. Um, I still personally am... I still personally feel like we need to have two objective things in there. Um, given we have a little bit up in the air, do we have to make a definitive decision tonight? Can it be that we, you know, somebody is talking to Emma, getting a little bit of clarification, and are we able to add it to next week, or do we have to decide tonight? No. no. Can I just say, I, I, I just, I don't understand. So whether it's percent positivity, that's an objective number. Whether we have a trigger at 3% or 5%, that's a subjective criterion. The uh, case count in Hadley is an objective number. 
whether we think five is a trigger or 10 is a trigger, the state picked five, that's a subjective criterion. So we have objective metrics, how we choose to interpret those, whether it's three or 5%, five or 10 case count, that's the subjectivity. So there's subjectivity through all of this, Tara. So just to be clear, I, the state is not picking 5%, just so that's clear. I think it's when they put on their map, it's, I, I forget without having it up right now, but I think it's like greater than eight, ca eight cases per 100,000, I think. It's I think that's- five that triggers- Do I have it? Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, give me one second here. But it's for so the, the description in the white, time. the description in the white unshaded area, I thought referenced fewer than five cases for our small, smaller populations. And it's the five that I'm saying doesn't have a strong foundation in data. They picked that number. I do not know how, but, no, but they didn't. That's my point. This is what I'm talking about there. So the average daily cases per hundred thousand is greater than eight, okay, but okay. we don't have a hundred thousand people in our town. So you have to extract, oh yeah, fewer than five cases, unshaded, sorry. Yeah, unshaded, few, uh, fewer than five cases total is just listed as less than five cases. That's their little caveat there. But again, an average daily case rate of 100,000 is greater than eight cases, right? That's what their red metric is. But when you extrapolate for a town that has 5,000 people, it's not going to be eight cases that puts you in the red. It's going to be less than that. So Agreed. That's, I think that's why we were saying like, Right. If, if we get, if we were to get put in the red on that particular um, map, we would need other criteria to point to as to why and, and information as to why we might continue to stay open in schools and not immediately go remote. So if it spurs us to ask the question, the number of case count is an objective number. How we choose to set a, a criterion, whether it's five or something else, that is a subjective risk-based assessment, just as the three or five percent percent positivity is a risk-based subject subjective criterion. So we just need to pick something to spur that conversation and set a, a metric. Five is whether it's five or not, five is a 500 percent increase over what we've had the last three weeks in the town. So it's a pretty significant increase, right? But it seems more reasonable than one or two. And since we put in some ability, contextual ability within this to say two out of three, these three need to be met, essentially the school criterion one needs to be met and then one of the other two needs to be met. Then we have flexibility to have that conversation. Is it as fully clear to the, the parents as I'd like? No, I just started off going with the two metrics, but I think you're, you made a good point of let's have a town-based metric. So this is the best way I think to have a town-based metric. I don't even know actually if you can look at the criteria of school transmission data based on what's Annie's saying, right? I mean, we can look at that every two weeks, but it's something that's going to be point right there, right then. We're not going to wait at the two-week mark to make action on it. It's going to be immediate action. So I don't even know if it's worthwhile having it in there as a criteria. I don't know. It maybe it's a caveat of, a, of the, you know, maybe it's, it's criterion, but again, it's not something that's, sure, we can look at it every two weeks, but it's something that's going to be handled case in point right then and there. And most schools don't, right? I mean, Cambridge didn't put it in theirs. Amherst didn't put it in theirs because you're right. If it's spiraling out of control at schools, it's automatic shutdown. It's like a fire. But hopefully there is some discussion, right? As we talked about. So just because again, one child gets sick doesn't mean the school closes, right? So how do you have that conversation? And maybe we don't have it in a school committee meeting. I, that's a good point, Tara. You're right, Humera. Nobody else uses it in metric Cambridge. Amherst, and I think maybe that's the reason, is that there's protocols instituted if a child gets sick. So maybe you just go in a county and a town-based metric, and that tells you, you know, following what Amherst and Cambridge have done. I would just add again, just for your consideration, I'll go back to my conversation with Dr. Joseph Allen, who said the two things you want to measure are school and community. And I do want to be clear, I did say if school transmission data were out of control, of course, we would immediately shut things down. But if you had had evidence of school transmission within the previous six week period, the school committee may want to take that into consideration when they're determining whether or not to move into the next phase. So, so whether or not you put it in any particular place, I do think it is important that the school committee, I don't care whose other plan it's in or is not, I think it is a very important thing that the school committee is considering and monitoring. That's a fair point, because maybe if something happens early on, we, we address it and feel comfortable and so that we can move into the phase two. But 
So I think it just needs to be clear that while it's something that the school is looking at every two weeks, that we're not going to wait at the two week mark. It's just a little asterisk that's noted that as cases are um, prevalent, they will be reviewed in real time. Action will be taken in real time and the school committee will still review that. Yeah, I agree. If we're looking at percent positivity, I'm still not quite comfortable with the 5%. I know I had said last time, if we're looking at something like 5%, less than 5%, then I think we need to look at, you know, rate of increase over a certain amount of time. Because if we're at 1.1% now, and we go up to 4.8%, is it safe? I don't, is it safe? Is it safe to use that threshold given where our testing positivity is right now. Well, so, I think that's a, that's a risk-based call. The CDC, the WHO, they say yes. New York State, they say yes. That's what you want, 5% under 5% for 14 days. But if we want to do 3%, um, because we're that's our risk tolerance, then that's what we should say. But I don't think there's a hard and fast rule here. Are you advocating for 3%, Tara? I am, yeah. I'd support that. And is that, I'm, I'm not being an adjutant here, but is that just risk tolerance or is that based on that Harvard paper that you sent? Both. Or is it just both? I think both, based on where we are in Western Massachusetts and what our current numbers are. I think the risk tolerance is concerning to me. And also given that there is information out there that to support using a lower threshold. And if it is all possible, um, um, I would like to be included in that discussion with Emma, Annie and Heather, if that, or everybody really, if that's possible to be included in that discussion. Tara, right, you're so conversant on these issues. I would really want you to be there. I, I don't need to be there, Tara. Exactly. I, think, I think you and Annie can have this conversation. I'm on the fence between three and five, uh, only because I I like the idea of looking at our county data with a little bit of stringency here regarding the school choice importance that we have in our school and the... Um, the five college area, honestly. These really strike me. One is, uh, I feel like we've had a really good discussion. We're close and we need a little bit more information. And the last time we did this where we like really delved into the issues and then gave ourselves some time, it helped us make at least an informed decision. And we, our next discussion could be that much more rich and informed by what we learned in that interim period. And then the, um, the other thing is, look, we're making, we're not epidemiologists, but literally we're forced to play one on TV. Right now we're on TV5, right? Like we're, we're literally forced to, to play that role. We, we're going in with the best hypothesis but we're gonna know more about this disease in another six weeks. And I, I'm comfortable in a, another week with more data and your recommendation, Tara and, and Annie, making, a, making, a, making that hypothesis firm, but it's not like we are not gonna be looking at this two weeks from now and another four weeks and the more data comes, the more we'll know. And, and then, it's, you know, 12 weeks from now, we'll just have that much more information and we'll determine is this, should we really be looking at this third parameter? No, we should like toss that out, but look at this other thing. So I'm, I, I like what I'm hearing. I think we're close. I would be in favor of more, more information gathering and making an informed decision, knowing that this is not like, this is not something that we cannot revisit we're going to have to revisit it based on the information we gather. That's, I agree. I mean, look, we were not epidemiologists. My PhD is not in epidemiology. Heather's PhD is not in epidemiology. Um, 
we are being more conservative than the epidemiologists, than the general advice. So that's where I take comfort. The best advice we are getting, we are going to be, based on what we outlined tonight, would be more conservative. And our numbers are in Hadley, where 80% of our students go 0.12% over the last four weeks, zero cases out of the last thousand tests in Hadley, right in the last three weeks. So I'm not saying we're risk-free. Um, even if you look at the in our county, 1.1%, we are you know almost five times lower than what the epidemiologists are saying are your, is your, your concern level. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty good, right? And so we were going to be even more conservative than that. So I feel I have a lot of comfort. I don't need to spend too much more time on this, to be honest, because I think we can follow what the epidemiologists who are professional epidemiologists are telling us what to do. And I think that's the advice we got from Annie to start with. That's the advice she got from Harvard. That's the advice we're getting from the state, from the CDC, from the WHO. I think we should just learn to follow it. All right, so um, I think we've got a draft here on the table. We've got an action here of Tara and Annie talking with Board of Health, uh, with Emma to review that draft. The draft looks at percent positive uh, in the county. There is some discussion around whether that threshold should be three or 5%. The draft looks at the um, case count in the town um, and looks at in-school transmission data. Uh, there was some good discussion here about um, making use of the rapid testing uh, opportunity that's available should we, God forbid, ever need to do that, um, but putting that as part of the, the plan as well. Is there anything else we need to discuss about this, these metrics right now? Um, we can look forward to discussing it again, revisiting it again next week. Okay, Annie, you're shaking your head. You're on mute, but I'm assuming you said no. No, um, <laughs> we're good. Okay, so with that, then we do have an, an additional topic around reopening, which is um, DESE's guidance regarding special populations um, for Hadley Public School children who are children of teachers. They, so as we all recall, we looked at DESE's guidance around special populations and we had a discussion here about those special populations that we would be providing an opportunity for in-person instruction to begin the school year. Um, and we had discussions with HEA around, around that as well. The, the guidance that just came out from DESE uh, recommends adding um, as a special population children who are Hadley Public School students, uh, but who are children of teachers who may not have fallen into one of these uh, populations that would be already being provided uh, in-person instruction. Yes. Annie, do you want to... Yeah. Anything yeah, that's precisely what uh, the guidance says, that uh, DESE writes, our guidance has previously indicated that districts that have adopted a hybrid or remote learning model should prioritize high-need students, which you have, for full-time in-person learning. The commissioner further recommends these districts also further prioritize children of teachers for full-time in-person instruction when feasible, since the models will vary by district. Districts will decide locally what constitutes full-time instruction. Um, so that is the recommendation. If we were to offer that to um, uh, educators, I would say, uh, and I would say our public school staff in Hadley, I, I did not that it would it would represent if all children availed themselves of that, it would represent 21 unique additional students, I believe. When I looked at the students that are already eligible, and then a uh, unique additional district wide, I believe it was 21. Um, I could have had a duplicate count in there, I missed one, but say somewhere between 21 and 25 max. Um, that is not limited only to teachers. I did public school staff, right? I didn't say only teachers. You could work in another function in the public schools and you would still be, I, I included those children as well. All Hadley Public Schools employees, but I didn't just limit it to the role of unit A employee teacher. Can I ask a clarification question? Mm -hmm. um, when I read this, I kind of read it two different ways. 
So the, the first one I read it as for, um, they recommend um, not only prioritizing um, special needs, but also um, children of teachers for full-time in-person instruction. I read that as in district. Mm -hmm. So, but it doesn't say that. This is just simply my interpretation. I read it as in district. But the second bullet that I read, I read it more vague. Like I'm reading that as it's a full-time remote district, as in no students are coming in, but the teachers are being asked to present to the school and their children are allowed to come in and be in the classroom while their parents are teaching. So I'm just curious how, what, maybe there's an actual answer and what the way I should be interpreting it. Yeah, so um, I don't, I would have to ask Commissioner Riley directly. I can say that we are not uh, fully remote because we have special populations in, but um, I would have to ask him that question directly. Um, if we have students present, Hadley Public School children present, I will say that um, understandably our school nurses have asked some very good questions about the um, soundness of bringing in students from other districts to sit in the back of the room, study, do something. So they've raised some very good questions about does that make sense in terms of what we've tried to do in keeping cohorts apart and also their responsibilities. When a child enters Hadley Public Schools, they have to review medical records, they have to do a number of other things. So, but I don't know specifically, I can ask Commissioner Riley directly. Um, at the time, I knew that we were not fully remote. We have special populations in was more focused on the first bullet. So the 21 unique additional students that you identified, are those all students of Hadley Public School Systems or are those just teachers with children? No, of Hadley Public Schools. Okay. Those, are, those, are Hadley, those are children enrolled in our district. Okay, thank you. Doesn't mean they would all do that. And again, it's, it's a pretty accurate count, but I could have duplicated a name or I, I could have skipped one, right? Because some of those children were already represented in special populations, potentially. Wait, I'm not sure I heard that right. I'm just gonna ask you for a little clarification. Those 20 are not presently enrolled in Hadley schools? They are enrolled. They are, okay. So the 20 are in Hadley schools and uh, they may or may not, it, that number may be a net number that's less than 20 if they are in the special populations already so that could be lower and we have no idea how many of the 20 students would opt to be in person because we have not asked the educators or do we have some understanding of how many might take us up on that offer if, if we i don't know we, i don't know how many would take us up on that offer okay. so i don't know the answer to that no. and of that 20 how many would be at hes and how many at hopkins uh, the majority of them, I want to say about six, the majority were at Hopkins. I want to say about six of them were only at HES and the vast majority were at Hopkins. Okay, so six at Hopkins, yeah. sorry, otherwise, six at six at at school and then 14 at Hopkins. And um, they are already enrolled in the Hadley school. So if we permitted this, they wouldn't be in the back of their parents' class, which would be weird. They would be in the cohort model. We would just add them to the cohort yeah. model and make sure the appropriate spacing were in place. Yes. So really we're just trying to decide whether we allow, and this, we didn't talk about this, but just in case anyone's wondering, it might be, this might be ridiculous to have to spell out, but this is, because the educators may actually just really need the childcare. Well, you're actually discussing it now because um, yes, there was uh, uh, a member of the HEA just had done some great work to kind of survey the membership, but more importantly, the school committee has pretty consistently adhered to the guidance of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And this guidance from the commissioner, this is coming up because the commissioner issued this to all school districts and said, I am strongly recommending that if you have special populations reporting to your school district and obviously your employees, he also recommended that regardless of whether or not a district is in remote or in person, teachers and staff should report to work. That was also part of this guidance. So he's recommended that, that is true in our district, uh, staff reports to work, part of this guidance. And then he said, 
And if your educator's children are not included in special populations, I am recommending that you include them in your special populations. So part of it is also the guidance just came out three days ago, four days ago. A couple of more clarifying questions of, of um, the administrators here. Um, obviously, we did the analysis that said that we could go back to school full, you know, full in person. We had the space to space people out. But in this model of remote education where only special populations came back, can will that uh, break things, April, if you had 14 students and, and Jennifer, if you had six? I can no. go first if you want me to, April. Sure. No, it's not. Our my, The number for us would not um, influence any kind of change in classroom or, um, you know, anything that other people were, were concerned about. And they would, to your point, Humera, would be going into their own classrooms. They wouldn't be uh, the responsibility of their parent. Um, and so, um, it, and you know, yeah, so I, 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 I think it's a good idea personally, but I know Thank it's up for you to decide. Thank you, Jennifer Thank and you. April. Yeah. So the same is true at Hopkins. They would just be assigned to a cohort. I ran the numbers, uh, again, if, if the max came, which is about five students per cohort. So if all 14 came, and all those other ones also came, it might be about six <laughs> instead. Um, however, we already know from the initial survey data that they're not all gonna come. So it wouldn't be a problem. These are upper limits. I would be in support of following the commissioner's guidelines in light so, of this. Just to clarify, the what I asked in the beginning was simply a, a, a clarifying question, just so that it's it's really crystal clear that if we go ahead and proceed with recommending this, that the commissioner's guidance is for students already enrolled in HPS. I just wanna make sure that that doesn't open us up to something else where now we've said, yes, they can. Like, what is it? Is it all students, you know, uh, parents, you know, students and parents, or is it just HPS? And so I think my, my the way again, that I read that first one was kids that are already enrolled in, in Hadley Public Schools which I would be in support of um, having those students come back in. But I think it's a whole nother discussion if there's kids from other districts that would be coming in. Like I just would want that clarified. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's where I'm at. I, it doesn't say only HPS kids if we're using our district as an example. And, and I feel like we need clarification on that or at least a better understanding of what the expectations are. I agree. I think we should clarify that it's in district or enrolled um, Hadley Public School students um, for this guidance that came out on Friday. It, you know, and that's the part that just, it's like, I feel like the rules keep changing because new guidance comes out and it, it, we're trying to adapt to it. So I think I want to. Guidance is guidance. Yeah, I, I think you certainly could if you wanted to, if you were comfortable with HPS. I certainly think you could, if you so chose, move that, take that action. And if you'd like the other question answered, I could do that, or or you could. But certainly, for some, if that's your inclination, I would say that the answer to that does certainly matter to some of the educators, right, or parents. Right, because I would say looking at kind of that information that we got from HEA, I feel like there isn't any specificity there about whether it's Hadley Public School students or not. And given that it's just guidance, we could vote tonight to move to allow Hadley Public School teachers who have children who are already in the district to be a part of the special population cohort that comes back even in the remote environment. We could approve that and say, but they have to be enrolled in the in Hadley Public Schools, and if they're not, then they would have to go through the lottery process. That's a, that's up to us to vote on that tonight, or come back next week and change the vote, like d vote again to change that. But that might give our educators the certainty they need to plan for the fall. And I would I would think that we should move forward with that uh, and clarify later. I'm in support of HPS kids. I am too. 
If I can just say, I think some of us have talked about this before. I consider teachers essential workers. Um, and frankly, I've been pretty clear. I think the sooner we can get our children back into school, the better it is for everybody. Um, and uh, I, I struggle because there's an inherent equity inequity for us saying the teachers can now bring their kids in when we heard another mother earlier today saying it's going to disrupt her, her career to not be able to bring her child in. But yet we're saying these teachers, just because they have a special job, they can do that. Um, and, you know, can nurses do that? Can doctors do that? Other essential workers? Can firefighters do that? Do they bring their kids in? So part of me thinks uh, it's unfair of us to do this, to say one cohort can and another cohort can't just because of where they're employed. Um, I think if we're going to open it up, we should open it up more broadly. But we've had that discussion. But another part of me thinks just because uh, it's wrong in one fashion doesn't mean we need to keep still continuing something that's wrong. So um, if we can do this to help out the teachers, um, I think that's fine. I, as many families as we can help out. I wish we could help out the other parents that are struggling, that uh, are going to be struggling at work because they can't bring their kids to school or they're struggling with, with child care. So I wish we could help them as well, but we're not there yet. So I'm happy to help out the teachers and the other faculty and the other staff in the administration. So is there a motion then? Yes, so moved. As the I described before, I can repeat it again if you'd like. I have to allow HBS employees to send children to in-person learning along with other special populations or to include them in special populations, I should say. Is that about right? Uh, HBS employees whose students are enrol enrolled in the district. Already enrolled. Thank you. Right, because I think that also that helps to define we're talking about school age children here too. Right. Yeah. Should we also say <laughs> enrolled as of September 24th? I don't know. I, I mean, I should know this, but lotteries and school choice, if there's a seat and someone says, oh, we can bring our kids, then, you know, I, I don't. Do we want that? They can't jump the line. An employee can't jump the line on school choice or on lottery. So if there was, a, if there were, only but if there's like thirty seats that are not yet taken, and then those thirty seats get filled up by students who are not already enrolled in Hadley Public Schools, but this causes that enrollment. Uh, that's what I'm asking about. I don't think that's in our control, though, right? I don't think that's something we can control. I, I'm at seats. If, yeah. If we said, I don't know. Uh, that's why I asked the question whether we need a, a date for this rule specifically. Can I just ask, because if I don't ask, I'll be thinking about it for the rest of the night. We're obviously focusing on Hadley Public Schools kids. Do, we don't want to focus at all on kids outside of our district whose parents are going to be coming into this district every day to teach our kids. Correct. I, I worry. And, about, and I guess my question I, is why not? I, I guess I worry about um, the feedback from the nurses and the kind of the, the liability of having children from other districts learning in our classrooms, a curriculum that is not ours. It is, they are remote attending whatever school they're attending. Um, I, I don't know that I thought that we weren't going to go down that path. No, I'm not saying that we need to. I just, I feel like we have just completely not even talked about it like and, that, and if, if that's if that's where we want to go that's where we want to go i just feel like it needs to be brought to the table and at least hear people's thoughts on it because there is going to be a population of and i don't know how big that population is of teachers who have to come into the schools every day and their kids have to stay home so i think i look at it a little differently if you're if your child's already enrolled in hadley public schools in theory, if this all works out the way that we hope it works out in six weeks, those students are going to be coming back. So they're going to be added to that cohort, whereas students from other districts are, in, you know, coming in to a different environment, expanding our cohort, expanding our social network, then potentially going back to their own district once their school reopens and whatnot. So I look at that as our own cohort already. Those kids are coming back already. And I guess I, um, yeah, that's how I look at it. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I think at least Annie, what you had represented from the school nurses feedback was, was similar, right? In that you, yeah, you got it. Correct. The, the nurses were, um, did see that very differently. Uh, they saw that differently. One, they aren't going to be a part of a cohort. They, they wouldn't be normally coming to Hadley Public Schools. Um, they also uh, talked about the fact that every single year they thoroughly review the medical records of every child who enters. Um, so um, they're now essentially during the school day, the medical professional who's responsible for that child. Um, and it's not a child who's in happy public schools. And again, I know it is, it, I would agree that that guidance is unclear on that second bullet, but it is very clear that it's when the district is 100% remote. So also the good news is right now that does not apply to us. We are not, right? We have special populations in, so. I just wanted to hear people's thoughts on it. Okay, so with that clarification, is there a motion that we have that clarifies, um, this is for in-district uh, students? I move right again, a motion to allow HPS employees whose children are already enrolled in Hadley Public Schools to send their children to in-person learning with special populations on September 14th. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. So that was uh, an added topic. Review and revision of district strategy documents and superintendent goals. Yeah. So I think it might be... Um, helpful to just hear from the committee uh, what uh, I can tell you what I believe you'd like us to focus on this year and then I am happy to provide you with a draft of that uh, either uh, Monday or um, if that agenda is very full we can wait till the following meeting. So what I believe that I have heard from if you recall you evaluate me every year on the four standards uh, that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has provided uh, to evaluate the performance of the superintendent. The first standard is instructional leadership. The second standard is management and operations. The third standard is family and community engagement. And the fourth standard is professional culture. I also have been listening to many of the things that the school committee has indicated they would like to see prioritized this year. My thinking at this point is that under the standard of instructional leadership that I am assuming the school committee would like to see the district and to see me continue to focus on developing at the middle and secondary level, high quality college and career pathways. So as you know, we've been designated as a pathway school at Hopkins Academy. That means we have innovation pathways. We have early college high school. We've been granted an implementation grant for innovation pathways. And we are waiting to hear whether or not we are granted additional funding for our implementation of early college high school. So um, under standard one at the middle and secondary level, that would be one area of focus. Again, I'll run through these and then I'm curious to hear from the school committee if those are the areas that you would like to see us pay attention to and, and pursue and prioritize this year. Um, at Hadley Elementary School, we were awarded a Project Lead the Way grant last spring, but um, COVID-19 disrupted our plans to implement Project Lead the Way this year. However, um, we certainly still want to keep our focus on expanding technology, engineering activities, and learning for children in the early grades, uh, as well as uh, through middle and secondary school. Um, so preparing us for Project Lead the Way, the grant was not revoked. We simply put it on pause. And as we settle back into this school year, we'd be looking to, um, to getting ready to be a Project Lead the Way school. So Project Lead the Way is about introducing technology and engineering 
uh, curricula and instruction and experiences for um, school children. And it's about experiential learning. I also know that the, the uh, review of and implementation of an anti-racist curricula, things like curriculum and instruction fall under standard one. I know this is also a priority. Please keep in mind that whatever the district priorities are will also shape and inform school improvement plans and the work of school councils. So again, under uh, instructional leadership, high quality college and career pathways, um, project lead the way and these kinds of experiences uh, at, which is what we see in the STEAM lab at the elementary school and focusing on the selection and implementation of um, anti-racist curricula and explicit instructional experiences at all grade levels. Under standard two, management and operations, this is where we pay attention to things like policy, budget, safety, and operations, um, and hiring. So in, in alignment with the emphasis on um, developing or selecting and implementing an anti-racist curricula and making social justice uh, principles a priority for the district, I see under this standard focusing on uh, diversity in hiring, recruiting and retaining uh, diverse educators and staff. Um, of course, the other two things this year, um, paying very close attention to our budget. Uh, FY22 will probably be a very hard year for the town of Hadley, especially now that we don't have a lot of college kids coming back. So um, being as careful as we can in fiscal year 21, with our budget in preparation for a likely very difficult year in FY22. And of course, making sure that we implement our plan for reopening with fidelity to reduce risk and ensure safety. So that would be the focus under standard two, diversity in hiring, recruitment and retention, um, safety, reducing risk, implementing our reopening plan well, executing that well and uh, paying very close attention to our budget, doing the best that we can to make sure that we're in good shape with school choice to be applied to FY22. I can't foresee that the town will have a lot of cash laying around. Under standard three, family and community engagement. I think here, I'm assuming that the school committee would like us all to focus very much on being in close communication with families about their experiences in remote learning, in hybrid, coming and, and hearing about what's happening in the school and feeling a part of the school, even when they've made a decision to have their child learn remotely or in the event that their child has to uh, be remote because of a close contact or quarantine. So that family and community engagement will really focus this year on making sure that everyone feels a part of, regardless of how they are receiving their curriculum and instruction in the upcoming year. And under standard four, professional culture, uh, we think and we assume the school committee will support that we pay a considerable amount of attention to ensuring that educators have the resources and professional development that they need to be successful in these blended and varied learning environments. Um, so my questions for the school committee are, do those priorities, do those accurately capture some of the things that you've been saying at school committee meetings? Are there additional data that you would like to see to better define why uh, I think or we think these priorities are important? Would you like to recommend others? Would you like me to forget about any of these? Thank you, Annie, for going through that. I have um, one that I'd like to recommend and that is because um, we are such a small school and uh, we have very few sort of open positions. So our hiring is important, but we can't uh, really, it's just not uh, um, something that's gonna change the school, you know, uh, overnight. I think an issue as it relates to the anti-racist work that the school is doing is around training of our faculty and staff. And um, I'd like us to pay a considerable amount of attention to how we do that. Um, you know, there's a lot of lip service in a lot of other organizations and sectors or, around 
the nation, but how we do that in a way that um, makes a difference. And I, I don't know if that falls under management and operations or professional culture. It's probably like a, a blend of the two, but I, I would like there to be a very intentional effort to change the culture through management and operations in a way that is um, intentional about that. And can I just clarify, Ifimera, so would that be, for example, under professional culture, I talked about um, professional development around instruction in hybrid and online learning, but would you be saying like what it means to be an anti-racist educator? Can you just give me a little bit more of what you're looking for there? Um, uh, what it means to be an anti-racist educator uh, in terms of the incorporation of, um, in, in terms of being um, intentional about what, um, people are teaching and, and why that there is a considerable, um, that there's a strategy in place that every educator and staff has a strategy that is um, a strategy of self-examination and of curriculum examination. So that might, um, that might relate to what is being taught, but it also relates to how students are being taught. And, um, you know, we're, we're learning a lot about um, the experience of students um, going through the Hadley school system. And sometimes it's not about what they're learning, but rather um, how people are treated or seen or not seen. And so um, I, don't know, I don't know what book bucket it goes in, but I'd like you to keep that at the core. Yep. And I just want to piggyback on that. I, I, one of the things that I had just written down was um, just, and you've already kind of spoke to it, Homer, and Annie, you mentioned it a couple of times, is just the idea of diversity, equity, inclusion, kind of being a part of every one of these strategic objectives. Okay. Thank you, Ethan. Seems like the schools are a great place to, a key touch point in which to, to do that. And so the, that sort of analysis that we all should be doing from top down makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only thing in, in, um, objective B, the management and operations, just because it does reference safe, efficient, and effective learning environment for all students. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there should be some acknowledgement of the strategic priority around the, the whole COVID planning. I mean, the whole reopening, the, the just whether it's in person, remote, hybrid, there's a lot of safety around that, right? We've just had a whole discussion around safety metrics and decisions around those things. There's safety that you're implementing in terms of the cohort model, the schedule, um, the grab and go lunches, but you're also trying to deliver an effective learning environment. So I, I think it would be remiss to not mention something about COVID in that section as a strategic priority. And I think we brought that up in your annual um, evaluation, Annie, and that even though it wasn't spelled out then, you know, it was pretty clear the the dedication that you and um, the administration have had to developing those plans in a transparent environment and recognizing that they needed to be continued to be built upon. So I, I would like to see that somewhere infused in the strategic priorities. And I think it belongs in, in B under management and operations. I support that, Heather. And, and Kind of coupled with that, Annie, are, are, are there any here that you think aren't feasible in light of COVID? I mean, basically this, this could, one could say, well, is this all business as usual, which it's not, but you just say, my assumption is we're just going to interpret all this in the light of COVID. So what it means to be, to meet all these objectives is going to differ. Yeah. And I so really what, second that all. And I just want to add to that, if I may, before you answer, Annie, um, there are, there are some priorities here that we've had as our goalposts for a long time around STEM curriculum and engineering and innovation and leadership. And, and we, we definitely don't want to lose sight of that. Um, but in light of the shock to our educational system and who knows what this next year or two years is going to look like, uh, we know so much more about students' um, social emotional needs in this current uh, era or, or, or the way in which it, which it is not being met, I, I think it's important that we hold that at the center um, of our work 
as it relates to instructional leadership. Honestly, we know that students thrive when they feel connected and when there's peer learning that's taking place. So how are we weaving um, social emotional learning into instruction and just building that into the design of how students are educated? Um, and I think that, you know, you could look at that across the board. Right now I see social emotional factoring into family and community engagement, but I, I really feel that it's way more connected to learning than people uh, used to realize and are now realizing and COVID has really sort of like illuminated the chronic need for that. I can revise uh, this and I can bring it at, it may not be on August 31st because I'll review it with the leadership team, um, but perhaps a meeting right after that for your final approval. Thank you, Annie. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, um, approval of school calendar. Yeah, this should be easy, um, <laughs> I think, I hope. Uh, so what are you looking at in the calendar? We have our professional development days uh, prior to the start of school um, and students, uh, some the students who are eligible for in-person learning in phase one returning on the 14th. Um, and then we have professional development days that occur pretty much at the end of every quarter, except for there's an additional one in spring. So rather than having one the day after students leave, we actually moved that last one to the spring. So what, what that allows for is for teachers to kind of look at where they're at, adjust their curriculum as needed and prepare for the next quarter. Um, right now, uh, if there are, with five snow days, students would get out on June 23rd. That assumes five snow days. Um, otherwise, it would be the 17th. And you'll probably also notice that we are, for obvious reasons, doing things like parent conferences and open house in a very different format, virtually and engaging parents online. So we're not gonna have people walking through buildings. So you don't see the half days that you would typically see in the calendar. So that's it. Any questions about the calendar? Is there a motion to approve the calendar? So moved. Second? Second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We have a calendar. Yay. That's it. Okay. Um, great. So that's taken us through our presentations, our action items. Um, our next meeting date is August 31st at 6 p.m. That's our regular school committee meeting. Uh, but in the interim, we also have the Q&A session this Wednesday, as we were reminded of at the top of the meeting. Is there anything else for this evening? Is there a motion to adjourn? Do we have minutes that we needed to approve or anything? No, uh, you'll get them in on August 31st. Yeah. yeah. And then next week, Heather, so we're talking about the follow-up of the conversation of the criteria that we had today and then um, athletics. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, the program of studies and I'm missing something else from Hopkins. I can't remember what it is. Um, handbook approval as well as the school council process for electing and nominating members. Yeah. So school council, handbook, program of studies, metrics and athletics and extracurriculars well, on athletics are we going to get a presentation from eric or somebody yes because yes. it's a little confusing from the state so i i will refrain from saying anything sarcastic or showing anything on my face i won't refrain i agree paul <laughs> <laughs> okay all right thank you right. is there a motion to adjourn so move Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night.